Hello guys, hello, welcome back. Uh, we are going to continue today with um, our discussion of acids and uh, I hope you guys had a fantastic weekend. Um, probably not visiting with anybody. <laughs> I hope you had a nice weekend caged in your homes. <laughs> I sure did. Um, it was nice. We uh, we roasted a lamb, a leg of lamb, which is always delicious. Um, we did some mashed potatoes. Uh, I gave the kids, or Christy and I gave the kids a a wagon. So they've been asking for a wagon for a while, so we gave them a wagon. And uh, we have this, no, it's not a small yard, but it's kind of like a small-ish backyard in the house we're living in. And uh, it's got this little bit of a hill. And <laughs> all afternoon, even though it was raining yesterday, the kids were going up to the top of the hill in the wagon and then riding the wagon back down. Anyway, uh, we had a very nice Easter and I hope you did as well. Even though circumstances, the Easter that we had was a little weird. Anyway, uh, yeah, let's get back into this. Um, oh, and by the way, I know that today is supposed to be a, an off day. Uh, however, it's considered to be, and I think I pointed this out in the last lecture video I had. Uh, today, we originally had off today because it's a travel day. It's a day for everybody to travel back to Milligan from wherever they're celebrating Easter. Since nobody's traveling, um, we've been given permission to uh, basically have class on today. Um, I'm not going to have a full uh, set of two lectures today. I'm just going to do one set or one uh, about 20, 25 minute lecture for you guys. Um, Basically because the entire second week of spring break um, really threw us back in terms of how much uh, we're going to be able to cover. And so to be able to prepare you guys for that final exam, which is comprehensive, um, I would really like to push forward. And uh, yeah, so I decided we just have class today and um, we'll cover a little bit more of acids and bases. Um, yeah, and we'll pick up there on Wednesday. Okay. So, um, we've talked a little bit about what acids and bases are. We've gone through two definitions of acids and bases. We have the Arrhenius definition and the Bronsted-Lowry definition. So now we have weak acids and weak bases, strong acids, strong bases, examples of all of these. Um, but we've always put uh, kind of quotation marks around this idea of a weak acid, right? What, is, what, is actually, what does weak actually mean? Um, we need a way to quantify the acidity or basicity of a solution. Okay, we need a way to quantify this because using subjective terms like weak and strong is okay to some degree, but at the end of the day, we are chemists and we want to be able to quantify the exact amount of some chemical <laughs> in solution. Sorry, I don't know if you guys can hear uh, Hazel in the background, that's my two and three quarter year old who's back there shouting about something. <laughs> uh, working from home is amazing, let me tell you. <laughs> okay. Um, so we are going to use something called the acid ionization constant to quantify all of this. And this we call Ka, acid ionization constant. It's also called the disassociation constant. Uh, and essentially it is the equilibrium constant. For acidic dissociation. Okay. For example, if we have some generic acid, HA, dissolved in an aqueous environment, it can disassociate to form H plus aqueous and A minus aqueous. This is an equilibrium reaction for weak acids, right? So we have some equilibrium constant associated with that equilibrium. And in this, if we, if we write the equation in this way as a disassociation, this is called the acid disassociation constant, or Ka. And it's equal to exactly what you would expect for a um, 
equilibrium constant, we have concentration of H plus multiplied by the concentration of the, um, the dissociated acid divided by the concentration of the associated acid. Okay. So um, here we have a way of quantifying essentially how strong or weak an acid is. If the Ka is small, so if, if the Ka goes down, that means that there is less ionization, right? Um, that makes sense if you look at this picture here. Uh, if Ka is less, that means that there is more, there is more of the non-proton, oops. Can I just do back? Oh, I can, nice. There is more of the protonated form of the acid in solution, so there's a larger, um, there is a larger uh, number being divided there, a larger number in the numerator. Wait, the denominator. More, a larger number in the denominator, and because of this, uh, Ka is a smaller number. Okay, and hence uh, Ka with a small Ka, you have a weak or a weaker acid. Okay, so the smaller the Ka is, the weaker the acid is. Let's look at some examples of Ka. For hydrofluoric acid, the Ka is 6.8 times 10 to the minus four. Okay, and then for vinegar or, uh, or acetic acid, CH3COOH, uh, the Ka is 1.8 times 10 to the minus five. Okay. Now again, um, these are not things that you need to memorize. Okay, you don't need to memorize these numbers. These are numbers that you will be able to find in a table, such as table 16.5. Okay, um, check out table 16.5. Um, Basically, you have a bunch of Ka values for a bunch of different types of acids. Uh, and I will provide those to you, for example, on a test, um, if you need them to solve a problem. So don't, do not worry about memorizing these numbers, um, but they should be able to, you should be able to look at a number and compare it with another and say whether or not um, some acid is stronger than another, okay? You should be able to apply it using the principles of equilibrium and acid-based chemistry, um, but please don't, don't try to memorize these numbers, okay? So this is how we're gonna quantify an acid, the, basically the size of the Ka. The larger the Ka, the stronger the acid. The lower the Ka, the weaker the acid. Now I mentioned something a little bit ago called the, auto, uh, the amphotericity of water. So water is amphoteric, meaning it can be either an acid or a base. This is related to something called the auto ionization of water. Okay, the auto ionization of water. So, um, if you remember, H2O can act as both can act as both an acid or a base. And remember, this, this word is amphoteric. I just think it's a cool word. Um, now, uh, here's a question for you, okay? If we have water and water reacting with each other, what's gonna happen here? Are we gonna have a reaction? What happens? If we have a system that can be amphoteric, we can have maybe one water that acts as the acid and one water that acts as the base. Do you think that's possible? Indeed it is. Pure water. Pure water itself acts as both an acid and a base.
which is amazing, right? If you think about it, if you have this system of or, or, or just a glass of pure water sitting here, you wouldn't think that any sort of chemical reaction is occurring, but as a matter of fact, there is. There is an equilibrium that's happening between the water molecules where one water is acting as an acid and the other water is acting as a base. And they react with each other to form H3O plus and OH minus. Now, going back the other way, this is now the acid. And this is the base. Okay. So if we have an acid-base pair between these two here, and we have an acid-base pair between these two here, okay? So on this side of the equation, on this side of the equation, the water is giving one of its hydrogens to the other, okay? It's acting as an acid. And this side, this, ba this water is accepting that, that uh, hydrogen. And if you look over here, this water has an extra hydrogen, right, H3O plus, and this water is lacking in hydrogen. So if you go back the other direction, this water has to give a hydrogen over to here to go backwards, okay? <laughs> I think you can hear my kid. <laughs> She's being amazing this morning. Okay. Um, now there is some equilibrium constant that's associated with this equilibrium. Okay, if you have a system of pure water, this reaction is going back and forth and we are at a, a point of dynamic equilibrium. Okay, so nothing is changing in terms of the concentrations of the um, acidic portion, so the H3O plus or the basic portion in the water. The concentrations are not changing. However, the reaction is still occurring. It's just occurring in both directions at the same rate. So there is some equilibrium constant that's associated with this reaction, and this gets a special name. We call this the dissociation constant of water. And we call it Kw. Kw is equal to the products divided by the reactants, right? Multiply the multiplied products together divided by the reactants multiplied together. Okay, so let's do that. Products H3O plus multiplied by OH minus divided by H2O and H2O. Now, these guys are both liquids. And remember, our rule for equilibrium constants, we actually don't include the liquids or the solids in the equi equilibrium constant expression, right? So this just becomes Kw is equal to H3O plus multiplied by OH minus, okay? Uh, and this is, you know, it's called the, the um, dissociation constant of water, water equilibrium constant, Kw, water ion product constant, et cetera, et cetera. And at 25 degrees C, Kw is equal to 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. <laughs> Sorry. Kw is equal to 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. Okay. Now, in pure water, in pure H2O, we have um, another truth that H3O plus concentration is equal to OH minus concentration. This must be true. And it's true if you think about it just a little bit, right? Must be true because why? If you look above at this reaction up here, where does the H3O plus come from? It comes from another water. So the only way that you can get an H3O plus molecule is if you get an H plus donated from another water. So there is a one-to-one -one correspondence between H3O plus and OH minus. So that means that the concentrations of the two, since they're always going to be created at the exact same time in terms of chemical reaction, 
you must have the same number of OH minus molecules as you do as H3O plus molecules. So in pure water, H3O plus must equal the OH minus concentration. And what you end up with um, is H3O plus, because of this part here and this part up here, right? H3O plus is equal to OH minus concentrations, right? So we can say that H3O plus concentration is equal to the OH minus concentration is equal to the square root of the KW is equal to 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7. Okay. 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7. And by the way, the way that I'm getting this is um, I'm taking this here and I'm saying, okay, if KW is equal to H3O plus times OH minus, and I know that H3O plus is equal to OH minus from up here, I can plug that back in down here and I can get H3O plus times H3O plus, which is just H3O plus squared. And if I want to get the concentration of H3O plus, all I have to do is take the square root of both sides and I get the H3O plus concentration is equal to KW. Okay. Um, now you can do the exact same thing with OH minus. You can, instead of substituting uh, H3O plus for OH minus, you can substitute OH minus for H3O plus here. And you can solve the same thing um, and you find that the square root of KW pardon me, square root of KW is also equal to the OH minus concentration. Okay. Now, this KW, or uh, sorry, this H3O plus concentration equaling 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7 is super small, right? This is a tiny number. By the way, this is in moles per liter. Okay, the concentration... 1.0 times 10 to the minus 7. This is an extremely small concentration. Um, in an acidic solution, okay, an acidic solution adds H3O plus to the mixture, right? So then that becomes more acidic. The, the H3O plus concentration is increasing in an acidic environment, right? But, but, then this is the, the, the amazing thing about the auto ionization of water. If you take the product between H3O plus and OH minus for some acidic solution, doesn't matter what, this product is always going to equal 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. Isn't that incredible? It's amazing to me. Oops, I never made this full screen. My bad. It's amazing. So if you take this, even though you're changing the H3O plus concentration and it no longer is equal to the OH minus concentration as it is in a pure solution, right? So we're, we're making an acidic solution. It's no, longer, um, it's no longer equal to each other. But what's incredible is that this relationship is always true. No matter what uh, solution you have, if you multiply the H3O plus concentration by the OH minus concentration, you always get this number, 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. Uh, by the way, this is always true, <laughs> but I have to make a caveat here. And it's always true at 25 degrees C, okay? Remember the equilibrium constant is dependent on temperature. Uh, so this is um, certainly true, always true at 25 degrees C. At different temperatures, you have a slightly different KW value. Okay, so you have a slightly different number here. Um, but you can take a solution at whatever temperature, and if as long as you have the KW for that temperature, uh, it will never change. And at 25 degrees C, it also never changes. Okay, so this means that... What does this mean? If the H3O plus concentration goes up, then that means that the H or the OH minus concentration must 
go down if this number is always going to be true. If the multiplication between the two values is always the same number, as H3O plus goes up, OH minus must necessarily come down. And it must come down in order to keep that product at 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. Okay, so if we look at an example here, let's do an example. Say we've measured the H3O plus concentration to be equal to 1.0 times 10 to the minus 3 molar. Ooh, that's a bad 3. Okay. Um, we know that H3O plus multiplied by OH minus is equal to 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14, always, right? We can solve for the OH minus concentration by noting that 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14 divided by the concentration of H3O. Whoa. My threes are not on point today, guys. H3O plus, okay, so if we divide it by that concentration there, um, which we can just plug that in directly as 1.0 times 10 to the minus 3 molar, we get 1.0 times 10 to the minus 11 molar. Now remember, um, I know that you're looking at these units and being like, wait a minute, this is per molar. Remember that the, the units of equilibrium constant are always um, assumed, okay? We never really, we don't write the uh, units for the equilibrium constant. Um, and basically any numbers that you put in with an equilibrium constant, you're always gonna get out the right values as long as you use molarity, okay? So we're looking for a concentration here. So the, the thing that we get out has units of molarity. And that just makes this a little bit easier to do these calculations and not really worry so much about the units. Okay, but we solved here for the concentration of OH minus, which is really tiny. And this must be the concentration of OH minus in solution because this value always has to be 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14. So if you know the H3O plus concentration, you must know the OH minus concentration as well. So we have um, a certain scale. So in acidic solutions, in acidic solutions we have the H3O plus concentration is greater than the OH minus concentration. In basic solutions, we have the OH or the H3O plus, let's keep it on this side is less than the OH minus concentration, okay? Now, in something called a neutral solution, the H3O plus concentration is equal to the OH minus concentration, okay? In all cases, if you take the multiplication of H3O plus, so the product of H3O plus and OH minus, it's always going to equal 1.0 times 10 to the minus 14 at 25 degrees C. Okay, so no matter what case you're in, acidic, basic, neutral, doesn't matter. If you take the product of these two values, you will always get this number. And this brings us to a special scale that we can use to talk about the acidity or basicity of a system. And this comes from the fact that these numbers here are really, really tiny, okay? And the numbers we're dealing with are too tiny. Um, so what we want to do is actually transfer this into a logarithmic scale. Logarithms basically squeeze um, numbers that are really far apart, okay? They, they take numbers that are really far apart in terms of their magnitude and they squeeze that magnitude down. Uh, and in the case of log base 10, it squeezes it down by about a, by a factor of 10. Okay, so if we take um, this, this new idea of squeezing these numbers down into something more manageable or understandable, um, we come up with something called the pH scale. Okay, the pH scale. pH is defined as the log, oops, getting ahead of myself here, the negative log of the hydronium ion concentration. 
of h plus. Okay, simple enough, right? If we have, for example, an H3O plus concentration, remember H3O plus and H plus are interchangeable, we can write either of them. H3O plus concentration of 1.0 times 10 to the minus three. Man, my threes today, three molar. Okay, that's the concentration of H3O plus. Um, already right away, we can say that this is acidic, right? We can say that this is acidic because this number here is greater than 1.0 times 10 to the minus seven, which is the point at which it's neutral, right? Each of these is equal to 1.0 times 10 to the minus seven at neutrality. So we can say that since this is larger than 10 to the minus seven, we know that this is an acidic solution right away. Okay, let's calculate its pH. pH is equal to negative log of, I can just put that in parentheses, 1.0 times 10 to the minus three. This is equal to negative, negative 3.00. Oops. And this is equal to positive 3.00. Now, if you remember logs, um, you can remember it as a cyclic rule, right? So if you have log base 10 of y is equal to x, right? Basically what the, y, what the log is saying is if I take 10, and raise it to the answer, I get y. Okay, so 10 raised to the x is equal to y. Logarithms are trying to answer, basically find the answer that 10 is raised to, x in this case, in order to get y. So in this case, 10 is raised to what number in order to get this value here? And of course, the number is negative three because we already have a negative three in there, okay? So negative three, negative, negative, gives us a value of 3.00. Now notice my significant figures here, okay? Um, we put in two significant figures, right? 1.0, this is two sig figs, and in the end, we're getting three sig figs. What's up with that? So when you actually transform something onto the logarithm scale, you worry about something called the mantissa. Okay, this right here is called the mantissa. It's not so important what, what the name of it is. It's called the mantissa. And it represents um, the number of sig figs that you initially put into the logarithm. So if you put two sig figs in, you get two decimal places out. Okay, so two sig figs into a logarithm translates into two decimal places within the logarithm, or within the answer of the logarithm. And um, it, it's somewhat complicated as to why, but essentially this number up front only represents the magnitude of the answer, okay? So it only represents the magnitude and the stuff that comes after the decimal is actually what's representing the value. So that's how sig figs work. Um, if you put in something that has three sig figs, you get out something that has uh, three decimal places, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So I'm at around 25 minutes of lecture at this point. So I think I'll cut it off there. And uh, next time we'll come back and we'll talk a little bit more about the pH scale in more detail. Uh, we'll get into the nitty gritties of pH and what it means um, and how we can use it to better understand acid-base chemistry, all right? I hope you guys have an excellent Monday. Remember, I'm only doing one today. You guys get a little bit of a break, but not too much. <laughs> um, I hope you have a great Monday, and I will see you back here Wednesday. Uh, don't forget, we have homework due today. So there, uh, chapter 15 homework is due this afternoon at 5. Uh, you should be able to upload it now. Some I, I've forgotten to um, make that uh, submission link live, but now it is live, so you should be able to submit. Uh, yeah, I look forward to getting those homeworks and getting them graded and back to you. Um, yeah, cool. I hope you guys have a great Monday and I'll see you Wednesday. Take care.